Good morning. Welcome to Resurrection Anglican Church. My name is Gene Krantz. I serve as the rector here. And this is the message for Sunday morning, May the 24th, 2020. Let's begin with the collect of the day. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. I want to share a few thoughts from today's gospel lesson. It's taken from John chapter 17, the first 11 verses. It's what is commonly known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's a prayer that he prayed just before his crucifixion. And when I read this prayer, I am moved to pray. When I read this prayer, I sense in Jesus a vulnerability. I hear his heart as his earthly ministry is coming to an end and he is going away. It's a heart of compassion. I hear in his prayer his great love for me. And I am affected by it. Jesus in this prayer is telling us how to live without him on the earth. And he tells us four things really that I want us to look at this morning. He tells us to live life to glorify the Father. He tells us to live with eternity in view. He tells us to live with the gospel in view. And he tells us to live with unity in view. Let's begin with living life to the glory of the Father. In John chapter 17, we begin in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. What does it mean to live life in a way that glorifies the Father. Why does Jesus pray here and why does the Holy Spirit give us such detail about his prayer? Bruce Milne has written these words. He says, this prayer is offered as Jesus approaches the cross. Jesus' commitment to his work of atonement is not automatic. The fact that he has come from the glory of the Father's presence for this very purpose, or that he has been determined upon this course right through his ministry to this point, does not imply that the conclusion is inevitable. Yesterday's consecrations will not serve for today's crises. The giving up of himself to death is a new and specific act of obedience on Jesus' part. And in a sense, everything has still to be done as the hour strikes. He must come afresh before the Father and deliberately present himself on the altar of sacrifice in a further crucial act of self-abandonment to the Father's purpose. 
Jesus wants his final work on earth to bring glory to the Father. His prayer is, don't let this moment slip away. Give me courage to the very end to fulfill your purpose in the earth. For us to live our lives for the glory of God is to live in such a way that the passion of our lives is to fulfill God's purposes in our life every day until it is the last day. Someone has written, my goal every day should be to follow God's voice and to do his will every single moment. In every moment of goodness, whether it be joy, intimacy, or delight, I can only feel that way because God gives me that. God is in everything good, and every good moment I have or emotion I feel is because he is there. Nobody or nothing else causes that. He delights in seeing me enjoy him in my life. But Jesus also prays that we live with eternity in view begins in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. How many of us have always thought of eternal life is really how we'll spend our life for all of eternity? Isn't it interesting that Jesus, in speaking of eternal life, doesn't speak of it as something we do, but as someone we know? Eternal life is knowing the only true God. Wow. If that is true, then to live with eternity in view is to live life knowing God. Jesus says to his Father, I have run my race here. I've glorified you by accomplishing the work you gave me to do. I know I'm not quite through, so Give me the grace to finish the race so that I can rejoin you, the eternal one, for all of eternity. He also says that we are to live with the gospel in view. Beginning in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. As Jesus moves through this prayer, he communicates the supremacy of the gospel. Jesus came to point people to the one true God. I have manifested your name, he says. What we see is that God chose us and gave us to Jesus. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And then Jesus communicates that those who follow him know him to be the truth sent by God the Father. Again, we remember that our sin had separated us from the Father. 
The only way to be reconciled back to the Father is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. I hear all the time that that is such an exclusive way to look at life. To teach that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. I hear Christian leaders unwilling to take a stand for the truth. I hear words like, I believe that Jesus is a way to the Father. The problem with that position is that it is not a position that is given to us as a biblical option. We read in verse 3, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus Christ is the only way that our lives can be redeemed to God the Father. There's no other way. And then finally he says this morning, live with unity in view. In verse 9, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. The heart of God is a unified church. What we've done is a poor job of unity within the body of Christ. Jesus reveals what this unity is to look like. I pray that the church will be one, Father, just as you and I are one. Unity is not just an agreement of broad acceptance. It's not a willingness to compromise in areas of disagreement. Unity is the discovery of universal truth and agreeing to live by it. We don't set the rules. We don't establish truth. We receive truth. And then we live our lives according to the truth that we receive. The universal truth is that Jesus is the only way to the one true God. The church's job is to figure out how to live that truth out together. I want to be honest with you this morning. There are days that I worry too much about what our church will be like when we return. Will our life together ever really be the same? I think if I've learned one thing during this pandemic, I've learned not to take things for granted. Things can change quickly. That's why it's so important that I keep my eyes on Jesus. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He never changes. If I'm anchored to him, then as things change around me, I can remain steadfast as he is steadfast. It did me good to read this prayer that he prayed again this week. To realize that he was praying for us. 
He was praying for me and he was praying for you. What an awesome, awesome Savior that we serve. He said, I'm praying for them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. The skeptical German poet Heinrich Heine said to Christians, You show me your redeemed life, and I might, I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. The authentic life that speaks the gospel with a spirit of loving sacrifice will be eminently convincing. So we are to live to glorify the Father. We are to live with eternity in view. We are to live with the gospel in view. And we are to live with unity in view. We finish well by living well. Hopefully our being together is only a few weeks away. I look forward to seeing each of you, regardless of what that looks like. And until then, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you soon.